Over the course of the past few years, we've been charting on the damage report the increasing amount of both calls for violence in politics and the normalization of violence when it does happen. And of course, in the past few weeks, we've seen a terrible instance of that with the the mass killing in Buffalo seeming to be centered around some of the conspiracy theories we've seen become increasingly common on the right over the past few years. In the wake of that shooting, those outlets, including Fox News, have doubled down on this sort of rhetoric. And so we wanted to touch base with an expert who's been tracking some of the insanity that's been going on in our politics over the past few years. So we're very lucky to be joined on the program once again by the president of the World Mental Health Coalition and the co-founder of Violence Prevention Institute at Columbia. Benny Lee, welcome back to the show. Thank you, thank you for having me. Very glad to have you here. You know, Wish we could be talking about something a little bit more positive, but um, what, what do you make of the, the linkage that seems to be there between the motivations of some of these acts of violence and the rhetoric that we're seeing being normalized on the right? Yes, it's very concerning. And I think it's important to note that violence is a public health issue. What I mean by that is that it is predictable and preventable. And we know how to prevent it. We also know what causes it. And uh, that is one of the reasons why a group of us have warned that a wave of violence would come uh, specifically from the last presidency. As uh, you didn't quite mention it, but I edited the dangerous case of Donald Trump. 37 psychiatrists and mental health experts assess the president. Uh, The reason why we came forth was because while violence is not so um, easy to predict on an individual basis, in other words, it's almost random. It can happen at any moment uh, and uh, it's hard to predict because uh, even the most violent individuals are not violent most of the time. And so uh, so what we can predict is how it happens uh, globally. Uh, that is uh, nationwide or as uh, uh, based on a population. Mm-hmm. And uh, many conditions have been um, uh, been in place to, uh, warn of uh, signs of violence, and and uh, but most of all, the fact that we had uh, a dangerous president with a vast amount of influence on the population through his rhetoric, through his exposure, through the emotional bonds he created, and uh, now the spread in the culture of violence is what we were afraid would happen. Um, so the stoking of white supremacist terrorism, the oppression of vulnerable groups, um, policies that uh, increased um, structural violence, that is inequalities and, and uh, widened the gap between the rich and the poor, that would also, which is actually the most potent stimulant of violence, as well as um, Uh, bolstering brutal dictators around the world, renewing a nuclear arms race, worsening environmental violence. I mean, it goes on and on in addition to worsening a pandemic uh, to a far greater extent than it had Mm -hmm. to be. So uh, when when I'm sort of casting ahead, thinking about some of the variables that you talked about there, we we look like we are already economically there's some, some tough times and you know people talk about the possibility of us entering into a more significant recession. At the same time, in the wake of Buffalo in particular, which seemed seemed to hinge on this great replacement theory, Fox News has doubled and tripled down afterward. They're not going to stop pushing that. And you're seeing it normalized across more and more Republican politicians. Um, Donald Trump, who has had a re, he's had a reduced public presence since yeah. he was banned from Twitter, could potentially be getting back on Twitter at some point. So I would assume based on these things, with what you're saying, we would expect to see more of this sort of violence in the near future? Well, fortunately, he has been taken off of Twitter and some other social media accounts. And that has had perhaps the greatest reduction. But as you said, you know, we we were afraid that his psychological violence would spread to social, cultural, geopolitical, and civic violence, and that's very much what we are seeing today. Uh, And so the way to help reduce it is to reduce 
uh, some of uh, reverse some of the effects he has had by holding him accountable, by um, having some kind of standard for um, uh, our, those in public office and hold this kind of responsibility. But we have actually done the opposite. And uh, I would say that the trend has not stopped even since uh, the, the end of his presidency. And therefore, uh, we see his uh, ongoing influence with the um, even with the uh, primaries and the new elections and mm -hmm. potentially 2024. So uh, again, I, I would go back to this being not so much a political matter as a public health issue that affects our well being and our life and death. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that too because uh, I know that you've recently said that you consider, um, you know, Fox News calling itself news as a form of psychological violence. Can you talk about that? Yes. Um, so physical violence is usually the end product of a long process, and so there's a lot that leads up to it. And much of what you mentioned um, in terms of the rhetoric, uh, the great replacement theory, um, the kind of fear bound um, conspiracy theories that uh, are extremist uh, do stoke a great deal of violence, but underneath it is a psychological uh, propensity toward it, and and the psychological propensity is one of fear, of scarcity, of um, uh, basically dividing the world into superior and inferior, and uh, the need to be in the superior position so that one will not have so much uh, scarcity or or threat, and and this is not so much uh, a correct assessment of reality as as a psychological disposition and or when it is a psychological disposition it actually um, is a is a greater uh, predisposer to violence than mm -hmm. actual threats from the outside and so um, so you can see that a lot of what I described was is very much a worldview that Fox News promotes. And given that it's even willing to twist facts and truths in order to, to uh, advance this worldview is very concerning. And in fact, uh, given that the word news itself carries a connotation of truth and facts, and uh, we have in fact the opposite of that. It has, it's a distortion of facts and suppression of facts in order to promote uh, a certain kind of psychological conditioning, which results in uh, those who are exposed uh, accepting harm to themselves, uh, uh, causing harm to one another, and mm -hmm. then becoming a danger uh, themselves through extremism and terrorism. And so therefore, it's, it is a form of violence as well as a potent stimulant of violence. Okay, and uh, you know we've talked about a couple of the the things that are they're seemingly influencing this. Uh, Trump, as you said, he's been banned at least for now from Twitter. It's unlikely that Fox is ever going to be pulled from the air. Um, that said, is there anything that you think you know within the bounds of the Constitution and the First Amendment uh, could or should potentially be done, or uh, on the outside for those of us who are not part of Fox News in terms of how we fight back against some of the, the messaging that's being put out there. Do you have anything that you'd like to see happen that you think could lower the risk of violence in the future? Yes, I think we need to um, define correctly what we mean when we say uh, free speech or uh, rights of individuals or uh, the kinds of political discourse that we would like to have when it starts impinging on public health and public mental health to the point of it being a cause for harm, then I think we need to place limitations because in fact, in every other domain apart from politics, and I believe every other job apart from elected office requires a certain level of mental health, what we call mental capacity or fitness. And uh, when um, when public officials uh, start to not have 
uh, fitness, then then they're no longer able to even represent the own their own point of view as they claim to represent, and 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 that starts to cause damage and harm. Uh, and I believe that also we have to have parameters as to uh, what kind of level of health we desire, whether we would like to have a basic level of uh, ability to have mental fitness, for example, for news and information organizations, whether we would allow disinformation and psychological conditioning so that people are no longer able to make informed choices. I mean, that's taking away a freedom and taking away a free speech, not a promotion of it. Mm. And so, uh, so in order to develop some standards or to be informed of standards that are already in place, um, mental health experts are available to share knowledge and to help educate the public. And it's a great misfortune that uh, our nation has not valued uh, the knowledge that we already have in great abundance and proven with uh, a long history of uh, uh, rigorous research and um, uh, and just like any other field, uh, mental health has its own standards and yet, uh, we're afraid of that discourse uh, with, uh, with the fear that it might impinge on political discourse and opinion mm. and uh, health. But in fact, it is harming our health. And I believe that the American population has the right to know about uh, information and knowledge and have access to it as it affects their uh, everyday life and their ability to uh, their ability to carry out self-rule. In fact, mm -hmm. I believe it is very fundamental to democracy. And there's mm -hmm. been a silencing uh, rather than uh, highlighting of that importance. Yeah, and in a broader sense, definitely a lot of Americans have been turned against public health officials more broadly against medical experts and all that. And at a time when we, we really do need them to be a part of this. Um, yes, but absolutely. in any event, uh, I want to thank you, uh, as always, for taking time out to join us and, and breaking down some of this. Uh, Bainey Lee, we really do appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Check out the Damage Report podcast each day, wherever you get your podcasts, whether Pocket Casts or Stitcher or iTunes. You can join me as I give you the news and stories you want, with a range of co-hosts and interview guests jumping in on the fun each day. Again, that's the Damage Report, wherever you get your podcasts. And if you get them at iTunes, don't forget to rate and review. Sometimes I'll read them live on the show.